I think the first hint I got of a violent breakup was when I made a tour of all of the republics in 1983, and I heard a lot of sort of separatist sentiments uh, in several of the republics, especially Slovenia and Croatia, but not only. And uh, some very uh, threatening remarks were made in the course of my conversations about what we would do to them and so on. By themselves, neither Slovenia nor Croatia had the diplomatic or military power to actually separate, to challenge Yugoslavia's federal army, which was the fourth largest in Europe. But Germany provided not only diplomatic support, but also weapons, even after an international arms embargo. And I wrote a story about it, which was called The Blockade's a Joke. Uh, and this, so I went and started checking the ports uh, like uh, Split and, and uh, the ports along the, the Dalmatian coast. And, uh, uh, and as best I could, checking the stuff that was coming across the borders. And uh, there was no limitation. We, we saw a Croatian MiG-21 shot down in the Kraina, uh, which the Croatians said came from uh, former Yugoslav Air Force stock. In fact, it was clearly from East German Air Force stock it had the East German radar warning receivers on board. So we know that, that these weapons are coming from the uh, former uh, East German stock, so that they're, if you like, slightly disguised uh, in, in the sense that they don't look like West German weapons, but they are coming from West Germany, obviously with the West German government's blessing. There can be no other way in which heavy weapons can be supplied like this. While separatist forces were being armed, Germany was, at the same time, warning the Yugoslav government of Andrzej Markovic not to use force against separatists. Andrzej Markovic, who was himself a Croatian, presided over a divided government which was unable to stand up to German pressure or rally his government for the challenges ahead. Uh, he never lined up you know, coalition support. Uh, he always uh, flew solo. So, you know, he could be welcomed in the White House and was. Uh, but he didn't have any backing at home. So in that sense, he was a real failure and a disastrous one in that he preserved the fiction that Yugoslavia was holding together. The Yugoslav Federal Army, which held the country together, now became a target for those who wanted to break it apart. At the Croatian separatist rally in the streets in May of 1991, Demonstrators strangled a young soldier of the Federal Army and then tossed his dead body onto the street. This and similar events seem to bear out predictions by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA said in 1990, October, that Yugoslavia faced breakup, probably violent, uh, as early as six months from the time of the report. And nobody paid any attention to it in the higher echelons of government. By June of 1991, however, U.S. Secretary of State James Baker decided to make one attempt to prevent a disaster. He flew to Belgrade, the capital of Yugoslavia, to confront leaders of the Six Republics. He said, don't any of you take steps that are not uh, agreed on by the others. However, Milan Kucin and Franjo Tuđman, leaders of the Slovenian and Croatian republics, were confident that they could ignore the U.S. Secretary of State. They declared their independence just days later, on June 26th, because they could count on the support of German Foreign Minister Genscher and Austrian Foreign Minister Alois Mock. The cycle of violence which would destroy Yugoslavia began when Slovene President Milan Kucha ordered his troops to seize customs posts on the Yugoslav borders with Austria and Italy and the Slovene capital of Yugoslav. Yugoslav flags were taken down and replaced with Slovenian flags. And the Slovenes thought they had a right to take down their flags. The end of an internationally recognized country. And uh, I don't think that the, for a moment they were expected there would be violent resistance. To avoid violence, Yugoslav Army General Andrija Rasheta had phoned Milan Kuchan privately to let him know that many Yugoslav Army troops responding to this challenge of federal authority were not even carrying live ammunition. 
But in fact, the slavery took a terrible job. They were getting a lot of encouragement from across the way, from Vienna and uh, Germany too. And they foresaw that they could uh, make a very big international trade by having what they called a war of independence, nothing of the sort. German Foreign Minister Hans Dieter Genscher flew to the Austrian border with Yugoslavia to join President Kuchan and warned the federal army against efforts to maintain control of federal borders. Kuchan ordered his forces to fire on Yugoslav army troops, including those who carried no live ammunition. Faced with international opposition led by Germany, Yugoslav President Markovic ordered the federal army to withdraw from Slovenia without a serious attempt to counter separatist forces. Slovene leaders conducted a masterful public relations effort Foreign reporters were kept occupied in an underground press center with briefings that suggested that Slovene forces had defeated the fourth largest army in Europe. Journalists in the press center routinely reported as news fanciful briefings from Slovene officials on various battles, including some that had never happened. What was going on in Slovenia, where the Slovenians declared independence and set up customs posts on the road? tended to be seen and portrayed on television as the, uh, the Yugoslav army acting aggressively against Slovenia as opposed to the Slovenian declaring independence. The manipulation of the foreign press corps set the tone for new wars of secession in Croatia and Bosnia. Repeatedly, the JNA was described as an occupying force dominated by Serbs. The reality was different, however. The army's chief of staff, Zeljko Kadijevic, was half Croatian, half Serb. Air Force Chief Zvonko Jurjevic was Croatian, and the commander of the Navy, Sane Grodek, was Slovenian. The Federal Army had held Yugoslavia together under Tito without creating any um, um, protest about human rights. Tito insisted on an ethnic balance. And uh, in the localities, it was uh, composed of the people of that area. It, it was third calling an army of occupation. And we should have, we the West, should have recognized it until there was an agreed arrangement for a dissolution of a state which had been Yugoslavia and which might take years or decades or perhaps be impossible. Until then, it had to be recognized, these were the internationally recognized countries. If German and Austrian leaders still believed that Slovenia and Croatia could be separated from Yugoslavia without a wider war, the Americans strongly believed otherwise. Because we said, if Yugoslavia does not break up peacefully, there's going to be one hell of a civil war. Uh, it nevertheless broke up uh, non-peacefully. It broke up through the unilateral declaration of independence by Slovenia and Croatia and the seizing by these two countries, uh, republics, of their border posts, which was an act of force and which was an act that was in violation of the Helsinki uh, principles. Uh, but the European powers and the United States ultimately recognized Slovenia and then Croatia and then Bosnia as independent countries as member and, and admitted them to the United Nations. The real problem was that there was a unilateral declaration of independence and a use of force to gain that independence rather than a peaceful uh, negotiation of independence, which is the way it should have happened. While most of Europe, including England, France, and Russia, opposed the breakup of Yugoslavia, only the Americans were strong enough to oppose Germany. In a decision that would have far-reaching consequences, however, the Americans decided to back away from this challenge. George Kenney, who would later resign in protest over policy, was running the U.S. State Department with the Slavia desk at the time. Our, our marching orders were, were to keep the U.S. out, to, to, to um, avoid taking any responsibility for a solution to the conflict. The analysts could see that the problem would get a lot worse. They also saw that the Europeans weren't going to be able to handle it. Historically, the United States had supported a multi-ethnic Yugoslavia over a 70-year period to stabilize the region and serve as a barrier to German expansion. In reality, Yugoslavia, a union of South Slavic peoples, would never have come together in 1918 without American support from U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. 
For centuries, the region had been colonized by Austro-Hungary and the Turkish Ottoman Empire. The Austrians, under the Habsburg monarchy, used the policy of divide and rule to maintain control, keeping the Slovenes, Croatians, Serbs, and Muslims at each other's throats instead of uniting them in their common interests. The Habsburg Empire kept going and held down a large part of what was meant to call Yugoslavia. Um, and uh, there was no possibility of a class get together until after the First World War when the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed and the people came together and decided to unite. With American support, Yugoslavia was founded in 1918 and survived German attempts to divide it up during World War II. When Yugoslavia's communist leader, Josip Broz Tito, broke away from the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc in 1948, the U.S. stepped in with military assistance, as well as international loans, to prop up a buffer state between the West and the communist-dominated Warsaw Pact. As the Cold War came to an end, however, Washington declared a new world order, which emphasized economic competition rather than anti-communism. So once that containment of the Soviet Union began to disappear as a mean with the decline in after mid-80s, Gorbachev's economic reforms, the NATO-Warsaw Pact, 